Welcome to the Burned In Teacher Podcast. I'm Alexis Shepard. You guys may know me as the Afro Educator. For the next few weeks, I'm going to be taking over for Amber, and I am excited to empower you to teach and live authentically. Here on the Burned In Teacher Podcast, we're still going to be keeping it real with conversations that inspire you to take actionable steps today so that you can grow through your burnout and teach and live with joy. Ready to take your next step? Let's get started. What's up, Burned In Teachers? Welcome to another episode of the Burned In Teacher Podcast. I'm Alexis Shepard, and I'm so grateful you're here today. For those of you who may not know me, I am a sixth grade ELA teacher in South Carolina. I've previously taught second and fourth grades too. I've experienced burnout two times in the nine years of my career, and I've even tried to leave the profession um, as recently as 2018, actually. I've appeared on a couple of other episodes of this podcast, so if you're interested in hearing more of my story and specifically about my journey through my burnout experiences, those will be linked in the show notes. So this is actually the second episode of our Stand With Educators series, and today we are going to talk about how to tackle the truly monumental task of systemic reform for education and for the teaching profession. Right now, the culture around education and teaching make burnout a virtual certainty. Like, it's it's unavoidable. Teachers are making the difficult choice to leave the classroom because of the overwhelming expectations. To paint a picture for you guys based on where I am, my state, South Carolina, has acknowledged and referenced a teacher shortage crisis. At the beginning of this school year, so the 2020-2021 school year, there were 700 unfilled teaching positions in my state. In January, just a few months later, it was reported by a state newspaper that since that time, since August, there have been an additional 677 vacancies created from teachers leaving mid-year. Now, I'm not sure what it's like in other states, but in my state, leaving the classroom mid-year is considered a breach of contract. And with breach of contract situations, the Board of Education suspends your license, or rather they have the ability to suspend your license for up to one year. There is um, evidently a process that comes with that, but the essence is that they can suspend your license for up to one year. And even after that one year period, they don't just automatically reinstate your license. You have to appeal and the decision ultimately rests with them as to whether or not your license will be reissued. From what I've read and from what I can understand about the current circumstances, most of the teachers who are vacating their positions mid-year are having their licenses suspended and the Board of Education of, or the Department of Education of my state seems to be making an example of these teachers. Based on the current climate of our profession, it's no wonder that there's a teacher crisis, not just here in my state, but throughout the country. When martyrdom is the standard and overwork is normalized, eventually people are going to reach a breaking point. In general, there's no infrastructure and no plan for supporting struggling teachers. And if we're being honest, teachers should really be supported even before the struggle. I read somewhere or heard somewhere once that when your body feels thirsty, you are already dehydrated. In a perfect world, you would be, you know, hydrating and drinking enough water consistently so that your body never feels that thirst. But that thirst is like a trigger for your body to let you know that you really need to drink some water. I feel like that's similar to the situation with having support for teachers who struggle. In a best case scenario, at least from what I've experienced, support is more reactive than proactive. I think that in order to even start to address the teacher crisis, 
we have to look at providing support for teachers prior to the struggle. Once we get to the struggle, that's almost the last resort. And at that point, support is almost too little too late. Schools and districts need to invest in building and restructuring cultures that are contrary to the harmful norms that drive teachers to burnout and eventually out of the profession. We know that change needs to happen, but this is such a deep and multifaceted problem. It's almost impossible to think about where we even begin. How do we start to chip away at such a huge issue? It begins with agency. Agency is knowing our value and being empowered to assert our rights. We can use that same agency in deliberate ways that influence our current situations. When we know our value and are empowered to assert our rights, we are more likely to demand those things that we need and require in order to do our jobs successfully. That doesn't just include, you know, instructional materials and things that we need to do the actual teaching part of our job, but also those things that we need in order to be holistically well. So that mental and emotional support as well. When we use our agency in deliberate ways like that, we become advocates. It starts with agency. And ultimately, that agency becomes a path to advocacy. I, just like most teachers, consider myself an advocate for students in my classroom. I also consider myself an advocate for teachers because I am a teacher And I am also a burnout survivor who has tried to leave the profession. I know firsthand what it's like to surrender yourself to this profession. I know what it's like to give so much that your physical and mental health suffer and you have nothing left for anyone or anything else. I remember how isolating and frustrating and hopeless I felt in the midst of my burnout. But my story is one of many that are just like it. We know that America's public school system has endorsed the concept of this unwavering devotion to children for a long time. Overworked, overwhelmed, and underappreciated teachers have been a norm. Yet, when we talk about the American education system and where it needs improvement, We only reference how it fails its students. We neglect the reality that our education system has also failed and continues to fail teachers. It does so by perpetuating the idea that sacrifice is the only and best way. This can actually be traced back to industrialization, um, and this information comes from the book Teacher Wars by Dana Goldstein. If you have never picked up that book, I will also link it in the show notes as well. It is this incredible historical account of the history of teaching and why that culture of overwork and overwhelm and underappreciation exists even now. So the ideal of this kind of ultimate sacrifice, can be traced back to industrialization. At that time, women were becoming more dominant figures in public schools. And because of this, teaching was viewed as an extension of mothering. So it was seen as work that women would already be doing anyway. They were expected to remain unmarried and childless so that they could dedicate their lives to educating children. Women who chose to pursue marriage and family life were forced to resign because women having their own families was considered a distraction from their commitment to their students. This is the foundation of teaching culture in the U.S. And if you think about it, more than 200 years later, nothing really has changed as far as the way that teachers and teaching is perceived. Now more than ever, teachers are expected to sacrifice most of themselves for their students, but it's masked in these clever phrases and platitudes that we often hear. So the school family or the notion of good teachers being like candles that consume themselves to light the way. 
even the phrase teachers are superheroes, all of those cliches insinuate that others come before self at any cost. And they also sort of exempt teachers from the human experience. The issue with the idea that teachers consume themselves to light the way or that they are superheroes really puts the idea of yourself mattering aside. And while we all want the best for and we want success for our students, we are going to be unable to pour into anyone else if we are drained dry. The thing is, selflessness and sacrifice aren't bad, but they become problematic when they are encouraged at the expense of well-being and wholeness. It's incredibly difficult to operate within a system that tells you you must sacrifice your being and your very personhood to teach well. Most of us, genuinely enjoy what we do. We chose teaching for the connections. We chose teaching for the light bulb moments. We chose teaching because of a passion and a sincere desire to help children. Yet so much of this job is not that. During the last year of global crisis and everything as we know it being upended. There has been a lot of uncertainty and fear, and even in the novelty of such extreme circumstances, teachers are doing what we've always done, our best. And if that isn't enough, we've adapted and iterated to try to make our best better. When we've taught virtually, or even during pandemic learning, When most of us were ill-equipped and ill-prepared, we were committed and dedicated to providing our students with whatever our best was at the time. But even at our best, we need systemic change. We deserve better than what we're given. But again, this is a huge problem. I've just outlined a few of the myriad of issues facing our education system, and specifically the teaching profession. How do we chip away at creating a more sustainable and more equitable profession? Like I said before, it starts with that agency to advocacy pathway. And that first step is examining our own teaching beliefs. The thing about systemic change is that We can't just immediately attack the system. We also have to be willing to move out of our own way so that we are not also providing an obstacle to change. Let me clarify what I mean by that. I'm not suggesting that your burnout is your fault. Amber actually did an episode on this several weeks ago. Your burnout is not your fault. As I've stated throughout the majority of this episode, it is a systemic issue. However, it is important that we recognize that those deeply entrenched narratives are narratives that many of us have internalized and taken to heart in ways that have made us complicit in our own burnout. Again, that burnout is not your fault. However, when we ascribe to harmful narratives, the choices that we make because of that, and the beliefs that we create around that lead us to do things that can exacerbate burnout. So creating systemic change doesn't start with attacking the system. It begins with stepping back to examine our own beliefs. We have to start deconstructing the narratives that we've bought into and look at how our beliefs are affected by those stories. We have to consider whether or not our ideas about teaching and learning are most reflective of what we truly believe. Examining our current thoughts about what good teaching looks and feels like will empower you to make choices around your lessons, your interactions, and even your time that are more authentic to you because they reflect what matters most to you. 
The next step is crafting a belief or mission statement that specifically addresses your teaching values. I have done this for myself and I've also done this with different conferences and different sessions that I've held for teachers is getting them to look at and reflect on what their teaching values are as I mentioned in that first step, and then getting those thoughts into a framework that they can consistently go back and reference so that they can stay grounded in their teaching beliefs and values, especially when they begin to feel that sense of overwhelm or when they get so bogged down in the minutia and all of the stuff that we often tell ourselves we have to accomplish in order to be good teachers. My teacher belief statement has helped me stay centered and it reminds me that I am still a good teacher even when I don't feel like it because I'm not accomplishing all of the things or living up to all of the societal or administrative expectations. My belief statement reminds me that this is what's most important And then I'm able to look and say, is this what I'm doing in my classroom? And if those two things are aligned, then that's what matters most. As you examine your thoughts about what good teaching looks and feels like, recognize what is true for you and also acknowledge that what is true for you may not be true and is likely not true for the teacher next door, the teacher across the hall, or the teacher on social media. Finally, and this step is really important, Amber talks about this a lot, not just on her podcast, but also in the Burnt and Teacher Mastermind on her social media platforms, and she has been preaching this for a while, but boundaries, creating boundaries around our time and energy allows us to focus our most important resources on what we value most. This is where agency and advocacy come back into play. When we are able to exercise and use our agency, we will be empowered to advocate for ourselves. Remember, guys, that advocacy is the deliberate action that ultimately influences change. When we say no to certain things, we create space to allow other things that are better or more important in. This deliberate action of making sure that we're giving our time and our energy to those things most important to us, we are being advocates for ourselves. And that is so important because in this work, we have to be empowered to create the change that we want to see. The system isn't going to spontaneously do that for us. Establishing and maintaining boundaries is a learned skill that helps us address the culture of overwork and the culture of martyrdom that I mentioned earlier in this podcast. COVID-19 has reminded us that schools and teachers play critical roles in our society, and it has exacerbated the inequities of the teaching profession. Inequities like prepping students for standardized tests that ultimately create more divide, for marginalized communities, or it looks like spending hours prepping lessons and activities that fit someone else's idea of what effective teaching looks like. And oftentimes, guys, these people are people who have either never been in classrooms or have been maybe separated from the classroom for a long time. As teachers, we also deal with tolerating legislation created and passed by non-educators that prioritize political agendas rather than the educators and students they impact. We are constantly asked to pour from cups that have long been drained dry, but we tolerate the injustices because we love what we do and we are determined to create positive change for our students. We deserve politicians leaders, and administrators who will prioritize the whole teacher just like teachers prioritize the whole child. Change is long overdue for educators, and it's up to us to stand together to advocate for the support that we deserve. But then those harmful, toxic narratives seem so entrenched that there's no way around them. I want to encourage you to challenge your ideas about what it takes to teach well and examine the origins of your beliefs about teaching. Consider whether your current narrative reflects who you are, where you are now, and what you value most. 
Next, create your teacher mission statement. I have a free template linked in the show notes to help you get started with this. Feel free to adapt this in any way that will best serve you. Finally, creating boundaries will help you stick to your teacher mission statement and it will help you channel your resources like your time, your energy, and your effort towards the things that matter most. We can all be part of a change that harnesses the power of individuals collectively advocating for a system that we can be proud of. But it begins one teacher at a time, one narrative at a time, one mission at a time. Thanks for joining me here today. You've just taken another step towards better for your burnout, for yourself, and for systemic change. Take care.